Hey everybody out there in TV land, I am Kurt Browning and I'm pretty excited about what's coming up next for the next, um, I don't know how long, uh, 35, 45, 55 minutes, I get the chance to talk to Jonathan Galland all the way from Europe. I think he's in Paris Hello. right now. And I think that he may or may not be on your screen. I really hope he is. And um, so what we're gonna be talking to you about today and thank you goes out to Tina Tian, who is putting us together and having this great idea. We're gonna talk about how a piece of music was created, well, a whole bunch of pieces of music was created so that it was handed from one genius to me and, um, and how we created a beautiful piece of fun work for IDI Ice Dance International. First off, before we get going, thank you to Douglas Webster, who is the boss, the creator, and the genius behind IDI, who creates work for so many great skaters that wouldn't necessarily get a chance to travel, perform together, have great skating experiences out on the ice, and thousands of people who get to see skating come to their local rink, to their local arena, and um, really just providing an, uh, uh, an out, an outlet for fans and skaters to get together in this, and somehow is pushing through this tough time this last couple of years and keeping things going. So it was an honor to um, get to be with him, and of course, welcome my star, Jonathan Galland, yay! Hey. Kermit the Frog. All right, Jonathan, um, first off, I'll just dive in and we've got a list of questions. So the glasses will go on and off depending on what I'm reading. Um, but the very first question is how did I get um, brought involved into this process with IDI? Of course, I was with my girlfriend, Alyssa Sisney, who is a member, a cast member of IDI. And I was visiting her and seeing the shows. And, uh, and I think what, what got me hooked was this beautiful vest that Douglas Webster gave me. I think that was it. When he gave me the vest, I knew I wanted to be a part of the cast. Um, and Douglas asked me if I would um, consider choreographing something uh, on, the, on the lighter version, something a little comedic, something fun, something possibly that would touch base with the younger audience because there's a lot of kids come to the show and we want to inspire young people. And so that's how I got in, invited. Uh, Douglas Webster is a genius and an artist and a beautiful skater on, in his own right. And um, so I absolutely said yes. Fast forward to, we start the process, we start talking about um, ideas about what direction we could go. And then um, Douglas said, I really wanna have control of the music, which is important for us fiscally as well as um, creatively. And um, so he said to me, I want you to work with uh, a musician, a composer, an artist. Um, and we've used him before in a, in a and piece called Solstice. And so uh, I went, okay, so he's going to write the music that I'm gonna to choreograph to. And immediately my mind just went kind of short circuited. And I said, how does that even work? Um, so I think we're here to figure that out. How does that even work? So that's the intro of my half uh, of the equation. And so Jonathan, very quickly, um, a lot of people who are skating fans may have heard of me, may have not, who knows, but they probably um, need to know a little bit more about you. So Jonathan, Tell us a tiny little bit about yourself, where your genius came from, uh, how you got that beautiful haircut, and how you got involved with IDI. Sure, thanks, Kurt. Um, well, my name is Jonathan Galland, and I'm a 30-year-old music composer from Paris. Uh, I was classically trained in the French conservatories from a very young age uh, and uh, playing the violin. Uh, and so in 2011, I moved to California, where I earned a couple of university degrees in both music and sound design for visual media. Um, I started freelancing as a composer and along the way I did music for animated films, um, live action, um, advertising, documentary, and uh, more recently figure skating. So for uh, the past two years I've also served as a music judge for the Junos, uh, which is kind of like the Canadian Grammy Awards, uh, if you know what I'm oh. talking about. Uh, and so uh, how did I get involved with IDI. Um, you reached out to them, didn't you? Yes. So um, for me, it really is an interesting turn of events uh, because I, I used to skate in San Francisco in Oakland, California. And one of my coaches, well, she's a 2002 Olympian and she used to perform with Ice Dance International. Uh, and she invited me to um, one of the shows she was performing in. Uh, that was back in uh, 2016, Santa, Santa Rosa. Uh, California. It was a show called uh, In Flight, I believe. And that's how I discovered IDI in the first place. And a few years went by and out of nowhere this idea crossed my mind um, to send them an email uh, just saying, uh, hey, I'm a skater who writes music. Uh, check me out, you know. And I, uh, 
I really wasn't expecting to hear back uh, at all, but that's how I got my first music commission from Eisen International, like you mentioned, called Solstice, uh, right in the middle of the pandemic in the fall of 2020, uh, a little over a year ago. Yeah. That was, that was not to, I mean, we have so much to talk about, about Misdirected, which was the name of the piece that, um, that we created together. But um, Solstice itself had a very interesting challenge because it was, it was almost like the soundtrack to a, a movie, wasn't it? And, you know, and geared towards yeah. very youthful audience as well. Absolutely. And, and that, was, um, that was absolutely a great project for me because I'm used to working with movies um, and you know, the, the type of emotions that you have in, in movies. And um, for me, that was just a perfect fit because it, I just felt right at home. Cool. All right, then let's move on and welcome to figure skating. Um, because it was actually, before I forget, it was so uh, making the process back and forth was so easy because I could talk to you without having to um, sort of interpret what I'm saying. I could just talk to you as a skater. And, yes. uh, and I, and I think that just that basically just made this happen. Like, you know, that communication was so easy and I could just riff about skating and ideas and, or I could send you a quick email and, you know, and I could just say Shakta and you, or, you know, or whatever the, the term might've been, and you would know where to find it on the video. And it was, it was very, very cool. All right. So it's asking me question number one, basically question number one, and thank you everybody for joining us. And, and I, we hope that we, you know, entertain you and also educate you a little bit about how this process went along. What was the beginning premise of misdirected? Well, first it didn't, it wasn't called misdirected. It was called physical farce at first and i think um i just was describing it to douglas webster on the phone while driving the car and i said it, I, I want something that that's like a physical farce that's sort of like unpredictable and i wanted un un like not a, a running order of events that makes sense i literally wanted the scene to change depending on who walked by and it got a little bit too radical and I you know I remember I wanted like you know Darth Vader to come by and you know like different characters and he quickly said can't really have characters that can be you know recognized like in that way so basically it just kind of got hedged and hedged and hedged what stayed was the idea the concept of having the scene dramatically change quickly just because literally someone skates by some new character is brought into the equation and and changing everything. Um, and then it got very quickly, well, how, how does that happen? And, and at one point I thought before my first idea would be like a, the, the characters are moving along and they get caught up in a commercial that's being filmed. So there's a director screaming and there's people with lights and, and people would get caught up in the commercial. So I kept that and we just basically expanded on that. So there is a director, uh, a bumbling director who doesn't quite know what's going on. And there is a assistant who has an idea that doesn't really get to see the light of day because the director keeps getting distracted by whomever glides by. Um, at one point he even leaves <laughs> and comes back with some cowboy girl that he found literally, uh, and, and he doesn't know what he's doing. So literally that's where the name misdirected comes from. And um, so that's, that's basically how the, the characters were slowly achieved and and you you work at characters from your brain or, or an idea but also with the cast that you have and and my cast was um luckily i had met most of them already so i kind of knew them um but basically it seemed like everybody kind of fell into a character and uh and that's how that happened so um must have been kind of weird having what's churning around in my brain to try to get through to you um, especially in the early stages, right? It must have been just like, okay, <laughs> what, what now, what now? Well, you know, it's it's actually um, fairly similar to what I'm used to because film directors are exactly the same way. Um, they are also trying to figure out the direction of the movie they're making, and um, at first, it you know, they they come up with ideas, and then by the by the end of the project, you realize, well, I actually went a completely different direction. You know, it's like, yeah. it, it looks nothing like what they proposed at first. So um, I, I also, I am used a little bit to doing that back and forth and trying to, you know, go with whatever the director wants at that specific moment in time, knowing that later on it might be changed. 
there's sometimes uh, actors talking about, I couldn't find my character. I could I memorize the lines, but I didn't have the character. I didn't know who I was in the role. And then I sat down in the makeup chair or in the costume department. And all of a sudden I knew who I was. And, and I feel like, um, I feel like it was back and forth. It wasn't quite like I sat down and the, you know, and got a face paint and I, you know, like, oh, I'm a fish, you know, like it wasn't quite that obvious. I think it was more like a game of tennis back and forth that the story uh, mixed and you came in with all sorts of ideas as well. So it wasn't like just sending me music. It was sending me ideas. And, and then it was kind of like laid on top of each other until something started to take shape. Um, so I'm going to take a quick peek at what's next. Cause I think it's time for another question. Um, how much did I have in mind? I think I've described that. Did you guys already know what genres of characters you wanted to include? Um, no, not really. But I think that, uh, I think that when you're, when you're looking at the bigger thing, I knew that I had a director, I knew I had an assistant and I wanted, you know, we've got like five female characters and five male characters and you sort of start to figure out, um, like well, these two people skate together, like Lara and Neil skate together as a, as a, as a pair team. So that helps you sort of make choices. Um, and as far as like choreography, this is my question for you. It's not even on our list. It's a very long list, so we'll have to work through it. But my question for you that I really wanted to ask is when I'm, when I'm doing choreography, there's, there's a sort of an infinite amount of moves that one could go or direction one could go with movement or style or pacing. And, and eventually you just sort of start picking or something makes you make a decision. I, I really, this part should go still. I really want the audience to think what is he, what's going through his head at that moment. And you like stick with that. And then that's like, you put that in the ground and that's some, an anchoring for something else. I've already done this. Now I've got to move. How do you make music? Like, I, I know that I was describing ideas and concepts and even a script. I, I, you know, I sent you a fairly detailed script of how I thought they were going to move around in the ice and what was going to happen. But, but how do you, how do you pluck notes out of the air? How do you, how do you make music? Um, well, you know, regardless of whether I'm working on a movie or, or a nice show, uh, my job is to um, enhance the emotions of the narrative. Um, and, you know, as a composer, you're often not, you don't, um, how can I say this? When, when the director tells you to write music, uh, it's usually not what you want to write, but it's more like what the director wants to hear, right? So you're just here to support the story, not to show off. And part of the job is to really put yourself in the shoes of the characters on screen or on the ice and um, appropriately express their feelings musically and without getting in the way of dialogue if there's any. Um, and so I've, I've always considered myself as a storyteller, uh, not through words or, or visuals, but through sound. And um, you know, Solstice, for example, was was about this uh, Alice in Wonderland type journey with a whole lot of, you know, a whole range of emotions. And uh, and and misdirected is more about how silly and unpredictable can we get this story to be, you know. And um, I'm always trying to tell a story, whatever happens, even if I'm not, um, even if I don't have like constraints or visuals, I just come out with my own story. You know, I, I mean, you can't really make a good movie or a good play that doesn't have a plot, right? So it's the same thing with music. Each composition I create must take the audience on a journey uh, with a beginning, a middle and an end. And it's eventually up to the listener to decide what the journey is about. So as a music storyteller, you can also provide your listeners with this freedom of interpretation, which I think is always fun. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I play one of my compositions to, to people and ask what they think the story was about. And you know what? I, I never hear the same story twice. Right. So I just get inspired by, you know, the story. And if you didn't make it clear what the story was, I'm making, I'm making it up basically in my head. But there's so many instruments. I mean, there's so many moves and steps and turns and twizzles and stuff. I guess, I guess you just, but like, it's fast. It was fascinating and it was really, really cool to be uh, a part of this project with you because at first I didn't really know how it was going to work. Um, but very, very quickly after meeting you via Skype and, and getting to talk to you and, and, and very quickly, I realized that I, I not only, I, I didn't have one more hurdle to get over. I actually had an ally, <laughs> you know, that I had a, a writing friend and I had a skater to talk to and someone to bounce ideas off of. Um, some things were, were 
uh, like very solid. Like I had a, a very clear idea that I wanted it to get quiet so that the rock star, I don't want to actually, you know what? I don't want to give it away. Um, but there's a really fun entrance for the rock star. And yeah, let's um, discuss this while we watch the. Yeah, we should discuss that while we're watching it. But but I, I wanted to say thank you because occasionally I did come in with kind of hard ideas. And so um, you were able to, to bring those to life musically. So, um, but you're right, let's not talk about it now. Okay, what's the next question? Um, the, how did we work out the actual timing of the music and decide how much space to give each section? <laughs> that was sort of like in conjunction with how many characters do we have? How many times do we want? Um, how many times do we want to go back and forth with new characters? And once that was sort of settled, then, um, then it became clear that it was like, if each one's three minutes long, this thing's gonna be too long. If it's 30 seconds long, it's not enough time to establish a character. So we sort of just decided together that it would be about 45 seconds. And then it was a little bit more um, usually, but sometimes a little bit less. So that kind of answers that question. It was just kind of made sense mathematically, right? Worked out pretty good. Uh, was the script written before the music or after? Mostly before, but there was changes after because, um, because sometimes ideas do change. I think. Uh, it was actually Douglas Webster who made a couple of suggestions and the entrance to the cowboy, uh, entrance to the rock star actually changed because of uh, what Douglas saw and he saw it, he, he wanted to change it. So even though you have three or four weeks with an idea, in three or four minutes, that idea is gone, you know, and, and you get kind of emotionally attached to that idea, and so, but you have to say goodbye to it, you know, so you know, hopefully that something better came in. Yeah. Well, I actually, you know, like personally, I felt like we kind of wrote the script also during uh, the production itself. Absolutely. Uh, yep. Because we were really uh, both figuring things out along the way. Plus, Doug also would, uh, you know, just send us ideas also. And, you know, maybe we try to keep us in check a little bit. Um, a little bit. Yeah. But, you know, it's interesting but because by working with you, um, Kurt, I realized that we both have a fairly similar creative workflow, um, which honestly I, is not something I come across very often. Um, and what I mean by that is, is that, you know, we were constantly bouncing ideas off of each other. Um, and I've worked with people who are not open about their creative process. And as a composer, you have to understand that I'm here to help you out. And so my job is to give support to your narrative with music. And, um, you know, when I have someone like you who puts, you know, all their writing, their, uh, I mean, all their um, thinking process into writing, uh, and how, you know, you get to that particular idea, it's just fantastic because I can enter your brain, if you understand what I mean here, uh, and, and I can witness how the factory works, uh, yeah. where, where you're heading with those ideas. Uh, it's, 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 I'm surprised you found your way out of that factory. Yes, <laughs> it makes my job so much easier, you know, um, and it, it was just a lot of fun coming up with stuff and translating performance, performance jokes into music. Um, you know, like when you would come up with, you know, a new character for the show, I would try to figure out how their personality would sound like musically. Um, but also sort of you, had to, you had to juggle sort of the pacing of the whole show as well. Like how much energy have we had yes, here? So, so you need to keep that arc. Just like yeah. for a regular movie, you need to keep that arc um, from, you know, Alive. Uh, beginning, middle and end. Um, but within that arc, you also have those little sections. Um, and it felt a little bit like Peter and the Wolf, you know, where uh, each instrument represents a character and story. And then as the characters interact with each other, so do the instruments in the, in the orchestra, right? Uh, but instead of dealing with in individual instruments, I was doing this with music genres and blending them together. So you know, towards the end of the show, we have, you know, rock music and flamenco and 70s disco, bluegrass, you know, back to back, all that stuff. And, and you hear all that within 40 seconds. Um, and so somehow or we do managed we? to make them. Yeah, we make them to, <laughs> to I mean, we were able to make them work with one another. Uh, and it's complete madness, you know, pure heresy, musically speaking. Uh, yeah. And so I, re I rarely get to have that much fun when I create scores for filmmakers, usually. Yeah. Un unfortunately, skating is known for, you know, you know gutting and, you know, skinning music alive, uh, you know, because yeah. it fit into our rules. Um, yeah, I was yeah. working with Cirque du Soleil and also uh, a wonderful situation where um, it was the first time that I'd ever worked with the music being written on site. So literally go up to the go up to the music room and sit with him and say, 
I, I, re, I need another count of eight. All right, where do you want it? And that was sort of my first experience of being able to have live music brought to life right in front of you by, by the artists themselves. It was pretty cool. Wow. Yeah, that's, and, that's this, and, and this person asked me, what I would love to do is to have a skater create a piece with no music and then just give it to me and let me write the music for it. Uh -huh. uh, that's something yeah. that would ever interest you? Yeah, I would, I would be down for that. Yeah, totally. It, it would be, this one would be hard to do. But, okay, so let's see what the next question is. Um, do, 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 that's sort of much of that. Um, some of these questions are a little hard to talk about without giving things away. So I think that we'll talk about that. Um, there, I uh, was asking if there was much room for improvisation and actually they're really, in, in good comedy, there's always a little room for impri improvisation, but not as much as people think, because it, it is a formula. And, and when you, you think you found something that works, you, if you sway too far away from that formula because you want to try something new, the joke, the joke is gone. Um, this next question, David Murray, and we want to do a big shout out to David Murray, who um, has joined the IDI uh, family um, in a creative and supportive role. And David uh, edited uh, misdirected so that um, when you watch it, it'll be a lot of David Murray into the equation. Photographer, editor, um, he did a great job. Um, he edited the video um, for Skate On. He said that Jonathan added sound effects after the effect, after the edit. And I, and I was really thankful for that, Jonathan, because I felt like there was moments that um, you get used to thinking that that's the ceiling, that's it, that's what it's going to be like. and um, because I'm sort of standing on the ice, but over there in across the big water is one more brain who's not done yet. You were not done yet. And without being able to give it away, maybe when we're watching um, the video back, you might point out a few of the things that, you know, it was like that you felt sure. yeah, yeah. would have enhanced it. Um, and yet I thought it was all done. It was like, nope, here's another, here's another draft. Here's another draft. And I was, it was yeah. kind of like Christmas. Well, here's the thing. I mean, you probably feel the same way as as artists. We often want to keep working on stuff, and we're basically never finished. So, for example, if I was waiting to create the perfect piece of music, I would never release it ever because there's always stuff I can do, you know. And so, yeah. at some point, I have to tell myself, "Okay, now it's finished. Now it's over." You know, I've stopped thinking about it, and I force myself to release the music. So I'm not tempted to make additional corrections to it. Right. You know? So, I, I, I think that misdirected is, is uh, it's a comedy, it's complicated. And um, at some point in the future, I would like the team to get back together um, in a chat and take a look at it um, and see how to remount it. Because anything, especially that's, that's, that's cast driven, I mean, performance driven with beautiful music and that, that you can kind of hit the bullseye on that first try fairly often. Comedy, comedy needs to be, tweaked and edged and, and you know and we changed the very ending uh right. at the very end you know like and so uh i i think that uh, i think that it would be fun to re to regroup and to take a look at this again um, because as far as i'm concerned even though this is edited and put together and people are going to see it it felt like a soft opening it felt like you know like you know we're going to show it to these few crowds and we're going to get back together and fix it right yeah but we don't always get that luxury so i'm, I'm hoping that Someday we can tweak it again. Yeah. Um, moving down, uh, can you talk about the process of choreography and choreography and creating this number with the cast in residency at Stowe? So this is where it was too bad that um, Jonathan was on the other side of the water because it would have been so fun to have you there and to have um, to have your creative uh, expertise and you know wherewithal right there in the moment. Um, we had an amazing cast. I'll say their names when they're performing so that you'll see their faces and know who they are. Um, but we had, we had a lot of, a lot of fun, the performing, the creativity. Um, I had, I had this many ideas and we did that many things. Um, for example, I, I really wanted, um, Colin, uh, Colin's character to be eating, like literally just, just eating during the whole time and, and slowly, but surely, uh, realized that it, it, it wasn't getting enough attention within the piece and, and it was getting closer to showtime. So that whole thing was gone. So that would be definitely something that I would want back in because I really think that it would be fun to see 
a character just constantly reaching into his pocket and getting another apple or a granola bar. So for example, in the, in the residency at Stowe, like when we were all on the ice working together, you think that it's a pretty solid object that you're bringing to the skaters and it's still so pliable. There's still room for movement. There's room for improvised creativity from your actual skaters themselves. And, um, you know, and you pull out your phone on the ice and, and text Jonathan going, this just happened. Can you, can you give me three more seconds? So, so that the hat can fall off. We can pick it back up or whoever it might be. Yeah. Um, did we adapt the choreography to a, the particular skater strengths or skills? Actually, we, we sort of grabbed uh, a young man by the name of Joe Johnson. Um, and he, he became, he was always going to be the director's assistant, but his character got much bigger because we felt the storytelling device that was waiting and unused was dialogue between the director and himself. So we mic'd Joe and literally he had no time to really get used to also not only skating and performing and acting as a performer, but vocally having lines to deliver while performing it. We kind of threw that at Joe at the last minute. And, uh, and he came through with flying colors. Um, so he's a natural actor, a natural performer. And um, I think he learned a lot that week, I really did. Um, okay, so here we go. In a group piece like this, how do you make sure that everyone has something to do? Uh, you don't. Uh, you know what, it's, it's uh, the one tough thing about creating this was that it was, there was no backdrop. So there was no place to hide people. Um, if I wanted them out of the, out of the picture, there was also no lighting, which means that I couldn't set the scene with lighting, which is something that we're used to in most shows and, and in IDI, at least at this time, it's fiscally, um, and where you try and where the show travels, it's just not, it's not realistic right now. Um, hopefully in the future idea, I will have access to more lighting because in this particular show, um, we were telling a crazy story. And you'll see it and you'll understand how crazy it was. It would have been wonderful to be able to separate the ice, to tell the audience as they're sitting there live where we're supposed to look, to see somebody entrance because a spotlight hits them and be able to see the energy between the director over here and the somebody who's entering. Yeah, that would have been that would have been really handy. So yeah. Um what do you do, right? You you make do with what you have and you you know, make your best efforts and best, you know, decisions you can in the moment and move on. Yeah. I think it worked out pretty good, uh, considering we didn't have lighting, uh, or even a set really, or even a yeah. set like decor. That would have been nice. that's so. one thing that I'm jealous of dance world because, um, with this, yeah. with the 270 degree view with the audience on one side only, you really, really get an opportunity to focus your, um, your, performance and and direct people visually where you want them to see one second yeah um so that's my son he's actually an actor and he's going to be performing a scene online so if you guys hear some some door slamming and stuff it's because his character is smashing the place and throwing things so that's <laughs> that's that's happening upstairs right now uh okay so there's a lot of acting and performing going on Oh my gosh, I think he broke something. Okay, um, the background players, um, we had a couple of moments where uh, the background actors were given things kind of in the last, the 10th hour, the 11th hour, because as you look at the big picture come together, then you start to see what's necessary at the last minute. So you can have ideas, but sometimes, Sometimes a lot of those ideas really do come when you see the whole thing starting to come together. Like, you know, when the, when the chef tastes the food, oh, it needs a little bit more of this at the very end. And so that happens a lot. Um, how did the piece change from my original concept? I kind of explained that one already. Um, when you watch this or any other finished piece, do you see things that you wish you could change or tweak? Are you kidding? All the time. Or are you pretty good at letting it go and being satisfied with where you end up? Um, um, that we talked about, yeah. Very it's good. it's tough. I feel like what would happen with this piece if we were performing it live, night after night, um, with a real audience with real lighting, this piece would just it would really blow blow up into something communicative and and truly funny 
and let the characters really grow. And, and the artists, while they're in the moment, would find things to have um, to have their characters come to life more. And that's what always used to happen at Stars on Ice because we had so many ensemble groups with Stars on Ice, a lot of them funny, a lot of them com comedic. And it wasn't until we were in double digits, we called it, until we'd done at least 10 shows that the things started to settle. Um, we've done this twice. And, uh, and so I think that, uh, I think that uh, the answer to that question is I, I would love the opportunity to massage it in front of a live audience and, and to see it grow. Um, but um, we don't always get that opportunity. So you try to hit the mark as best you can. What about the music? You, I, I feel like it gets to a point where you probably can't change the music without changing what the skaters are doing. You can tweak things if you don't change the timing, I'm assuming. Yeah, it's, it's usually all about orchestration because um, it doesn't require a, a change of timing, but you can still get a different emotion depending on what instrument you use. So depending on what sound texture you want. Um, and that's how I usually deal with, you know, like a director telling me, okay, I don't want to change the timing because we have a great scene here, but I don't like how it feels. And that's what I would do. I would just change the instrumentation, uh, make it- you know, The emotion. Cool. Yeah, it's all about the emotion, right? Remember those those three notes that I kept begging for that were there once and then they went away. Yes, and we, yes. We so that was, that was a, that's a funny one. Um, yeah, because <laughs> that was that was the first draft that I sent you, and then later on I sent you a second draft and a third draft, and and you actually stayed with that first one for some reason, and then it just it's basically sank in your head, and you were like, oh, you know, these three notes are part of you know what I know, and uh, of course they disappeared in the second and third draft. Uh, and you're like, hey, there's something missing here, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I it was... figure, I, and, and to save my life, I couldn't figure out what you were talking about because like this draft was like so far behind me already. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was uh, doing a Zoom chat the other day and I was talking about how I, I, I was working on a little tiny moment where I take off a hat and put her on my knee and it falls on the ice and I curl it up and I pick it back up and I leave. And that was about 35 or 40 minutes of doing the almost what looked like the same thing over and over again. And I wasn't practicing it. I was trying to, to decide. And then you think to yourself, 35 minutes into it, I, I had a count and a half of eight finished. But was it actually better five minutes into it? Like, what, you know, like as I changed it so many times, yeah. did it actually improve each time or, or did I miss the mark? So these are the questions creative people ask themselves over and over again. But I really wanted those three notes back yet. So thank you for finding yeah. out. How do you approach the process when you are commissioned to create a number like this? What kind of parameters are given to you? How much freedom do you have? Um, this question also applies to Solstice. Well, I kind of talked about it a little bit uh, already. Um, the process, uh, of course, is very different from piece to piece. There's no, not, there's not like a secret recipe where uh, you know, like, uh, okay, this is what, this is my checklist. And then, you know, as long as I follow it, it's, it's all good. Uh, it really depends a lot. Exactly. I wish it was like that, but unfortunately it's not. Um, and that's part of being an artist, you know, because you have to adapt. I think an artist in general have to like incredible sense of adaptability. Uh, they, they really can, uh, you know, compose with basically anything you throw at them. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I think it's 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 what we do. Um, but yep. uh, how much freedom did I have? Honestly, I felt I have I had a lot of freedom on that. Um, I both IDI and and uh, and you, Kurt, you you guys let me, uh, yeah, just drive the boat on on the music, and that was great. You just wanted me to, uh, I mean, as long as I did the genres you wanted and. Uh, the right timing, and maybe highlight a few moments in the choreography. Um, yep. I pretty much had free reign for the rest, so that was that was really that was great. Um, I mean, it was sometimes as simple as you know. I, I think I'd like all of them to be doing a, a butterfly at the same time, somewhere in the middle. Like like sometimes it was just that casual. Like here's the yeah. genre, here's the long, and and I was thinking of having the whole cast go up at, at the same time in the middle. And, you know, but I didn't really want to start asking for too many things because I wanted it to, I mean, that's, that's your area of expertise, but it makes me think about the Olympics and, and why more skaters don't tailor made their music um, for them, yeah. you know, 
exactly this much going into the triple axel and then I need exactly this much time going into my quad and I want to spin for this long. And it just seems like, seems like everyone in the skating world should be calling you, you know, like re reaching, you can get a hold of them through the IDI website and, and being able to uh, seriously from the impetus of any idea being a part of the creative. Um, you know, Eric Radford, a uh, ice skater from Canada is writing a lot of music now. And, and, you know, I think that there's starting to be a realization of how somebody who skates and knows music can really do something special. So I, I'm going to start sending people your way, man, because I, I, yeah, love, I love it. it. <laughs> but, you know, it's interesting you talk about this because, um, you know, every time I watch a, you know, skating competition or, you know, program, a routine, uh, even from elite skaters, you know, I'm like, seriously, like, why? Just the music doesn't fit. And, you know, this is wrong. There's a bad edit here. Like, is there like at least a musician to listen to that? And, and you know, it's it's just uh, mind boggling you know, sometimes because I'm like, uh, it's, it's, it's very easy to fix. Usually things are very easy to fix, but it's not there and it hasn't been done. And um, but there's there's a certain aspect of it that uh, when you choose a piece of music that the audience already knows, you're kind of they're kind of on the conveyor belt with you already. So that's a, there's something right, right. about that, 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 because also when we compete, we also don't have a set and we also don't have lighting. And somebody just did a country Western number before you and the place was like stomping up and down. And then you want them to come down for Dr. Shivago or, you know, for, yeah, for, yeah. you know, something like that. And it's just, it's so, it's such a weird connection of, of energies, but, um, who knows? So in the future, um, I was thinking uh, that I, I took a peek at the next question and it made me laugh because I did a, a piece uh, with Ed Robertson from the Bare Naked Ladies, a Canadian rock group. And um, and it kind of came from that discussion because we were having dinner together. And he goes, why? Why do you skaters kill music? Why do you chop it up? <laughs> It was like yeah. so angry at me. And I'm like, dude, we have no choice. There's always a choice. There's always a better way. I'm like, yeah, we do our best, you know. Um, so I got to no, but it's, it's usually it's not the fault of the skater. It's just, you know, the way it's put together and the skater is just focused on how to make the jumps work and the, and the different moves and all that. Well, if it, it can't be over a certain amount of time, but it can be right. slightly under like but it's only like 10 there's, seconds there's a, there's a leeway yeah. yeah and and every skater wants as much time as you'll give them so everyone oh it's, it's difficult but i got to work with the tragically hip uh canadian rock group as well and ed robertson from the bare naked ladies and and so i've, I've actually um worked with jeff tyler a friend of mine dear friend of mine who, who writes music he sings for me as well and uh and so i think the more collaboration a skater can have with the choreography and with the music the, the better the more control the better um, so I think, I think, I think you're going to be very busy. <laughs> Everyone's going to see this and want to work with you. Uh, okay. So, um, well, I think this is for me too. Um, did your background in skating help you understand how to write music for skating? And, um, conversely, how did your background in movie composing help you in structuring the music? Well, that's a really good question. Um, you know, yeah, we touched on a little bit. Uh, well, you know, writing for film and writing for stage, uh, and it's, it's very different, of course. And I think, uh, yes, the fact that I was coming into this project as a skater uh, was definitely very helpful. Definitely a plus when I write music for numbers like these, um, you know, ice dance in, in general. Uh, the obvious reason is... Uh, you can, like you, you mentioned earlier, you can throw me skating vocabulary and I'll see the moves in my head. So we are already saving you a whole lot of time and explaining and avoiding unnecessary confusion, right? So it, it may not sound like much, but it's something you would have to take into consideration if you were to work with a composer who is clueless about uh, what a three turn is, you know? So to tr try to go explain that routine of of 10 skaters to that person, you know, so yeah. nightmare. Uh, and there's a less obvious reason, um, which is also very important and it's called pacing. Uh, I think both music and skating are very similar art forms in the sense that uh, it must flow naturally, just like water, right? You won't ever see a stream um, divert for no reason, 
right? It follows it. It follows the terrain and always takes the path the path of uh, least resistance, right? So and good choreography, as you know, is the same, uh, and so is music. You know, as I said, how many times have I seen skaters perform to music? It's way too fast. It just makes them slow. It's excruciating to watch. Um, so, I mean, these are all in the back of my head when I write music for skating. I imagine the cast performing when I compose, and I'm always asking myself, is it, is it skatable, you know? And how about now? Is it still skatable? It's very important. Um, so, yeah. Now, my creative process for Misdirected was a little different than for Solstice, for example, because it was Solstice was more cinematic and symphonic. And for Misdirected, um, yeah, it, it was definitely different because, you know, when I was in music school, I learned to create what's called satellites, which is basically what a lot of filmmakers ask for, consciously or not. Uh, and because filmmakers often like the ability to, or, or the musical vocabulary to get their ideas across, they often resort to throwing existing um, music at the composer that they feel aligns with the mood of their film, right? Or a particular yeah. scene so usually they'll choose like a soundtrack that they like from another movie or some popular song you know depending on what they want and so the composer's job is to create something as similar as possible um you know uh, like i did i did that too exactly um and but without infringing any copyright right yeah kind of like walking a tightrope because i mean you know what i mean it's it's how close can i get to that reference track and not get sued for plagiarism basically. <laughs> um, and, and so I, I use that same technique with you, uh, but instead of trying to really imitate a specific song or piece of music, I would do that with a whole music genre. Um, and I don't specialize in writing music in any of these genres you hear in Misdirected, but the way you do it is you tackle each genre one at a time and you study that genre in depth. Um, like you want to immerse yourself completely and, and learn everything y you can about the music genre. Kind of like, you know, an actor preparing for a role, if that makes sense. I mean, we're just talking about your son here. Same thing, right? So yeah. for, for, a few days, for a few days, uh, I, I would listen to nothing other than that genre, and I want to create music um, in that genre. So I study the history, and how did that genre appear? And what are the stylistic influences? Like, what's the instrumentation? Uh, how are these instruments played? What, what is the common key or meter? Uh, and then I study the harmony and the sound texture, basically what makes this music genre instantly recognizable to anyone. Uh, and in a sense, you're looking for cliche elements, right? And then once you figure out the recipe, then uh, you start writing music that follows these guidelines, um, just like cooking, you know? You may not know how to make ratatouille, maybe you do, but regardless, if you really- I know what it looks like on TV. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you follow the recipe, it becomes right to you. Obviously, you, you're not going to pretend you invented that dish, but you're the one who prepared it and cooked it, so it's yours. You, you own it, just like music genres. Same thing. Nothing. It's like there's no new skating moves, really. There's, I mean, you know, occasionally maybe you could argue that something original happens, but uh, right, you know, but it, but it's yours. You know, when you do a power it's, red eagle, it's yours. A skating, a skating move is not copyrightable. Um, that was awesome. I love it. Love listening to you. It, it, it's very inspiring. Um, I think we're getting close to being able to see it. Uh, how fruitful is collaboration? Would you collaborate on something again? No, this is going to be last time. Um, is there anything I didn't ask about? <laughs> um, I think so. Anyways, I read that. I'm going to start that over because I, I, I did. I, that's not a real question. Um, the question is, would we do this again? I, and I hope, to, I hope the answer is yes. I, I hope we get a chance to not only revisit Misdirected, but um, I do like the idea even uh, of, of sending uh, three different angles of, of a program that I'm skating um, and, just, and just skate it and then, and then just send it to you and, and, and watch, have you watch it and see what you come back with. Um, sure. and, but but uh, just like scoring a movie, you know, same thing. Hope you make me look better. Um, I think it's time to watch this crazy thing. And um, I, I want to uh, talk a little tiny bit about IDI, uh, Ice Dance International. And just, you know, there, there really is a lack of opportunity for uh, skaters to get out and perform uh, in North America, especially. So any establishment that's, that's getting skaters out in front of skating fans 
uh, we need to endorse. And, um, and, you know, I worked really hard with Jonathan. I put in a, a lot of hours. Um, if I had my way, I'd, I'd double those hours and make changes um, and, you know, and be able to refilm it with three days of filming instead of two hours or whatever we had. Uh, of course, there's always that dream that it could be better, but um, just to have the experience, it, it was a real godsend. And I hadn't had a chance to do choreography at work in a long time. And, uh, and like I seriously say, I, I really hope people um, investigate Ice Dance International, IDI, a little bit and see the wonderful skaters that they uh, have to offer. They really, um, Stars and Ice has its genre, Holiday on Ice has its genre, Ice Capades and all that stuff. IDI is really, it's right about, it's really about the run of the blade. And it's, it's really about the beauty of skating and the truth of it. It's kind of pared down to the, the clean soul of what it means to be an ice skater. So um, I, I'm looking forward to working with him again someday. I can't believe I got asked to actually perform in, the, in a few of the shows. So um, it was a really good experience. So I hope that there's more both for Jonathan and I together, Jonathan and I and IDI. And yes, we're fishing for jobs. And, um, and uh, we are, I think, going to push play and uh, watch Misdirected and we'll talk our way through it. And we'll see at the end. And just like the DVD extras at the end, Jonathan and Kurt will now give you a little bit of a background feeling. At the very beginning, Jonathan is checking out that the director is asleep as usual. And because we are talking, you probably won't be able to hear the audio. So we'll just help you out. I recommend watching us and then watching it again without our voices. But this is Joe trying to get in a little rehearsal, which yeah, doesn't always go right. Joe is the assistant director. And he's trying to get in as much rehearsal on what he calls the Broadway piece as he can. And then cut, cut, the director wakes up and cuts. Hold it, you. Every time I turn my back, I was working on that Broadway thing. We'll find what we're doing. So I loved how many background noises stop. you put in here, Jonathan. I can't stop. Yeah, it was, was a lot of fun. Kind of like a, a Disney type um, <laughs> show. But it really helps set the mood for being on a set. Do you call that a dip? Well, hey, you. here's my 70s disco. That's a dip. We had a little problem with the microphone because the what microphone was on my chest. And every time I spoke through the megaphone, it well, took my voice it. away from the microphone. We couldn't figure out what the problem was at first. Uh -huh. There's Lara Shelton doing her little disco. And I had so much fun with all these great skaters. We've got on the, uh, well, I guess they left. So there's Joe Johnson. And the director is basically just reacting to everything that he sees around him and he just sort of puts his minions to work and the poor skaters or dancers however you want to think of them don't really know what to expect there's adam kaplan with a beautiful rabian there's yeah, angela so here's my uh, my friend natalie who's doing some voiceover on that track uh we just heard it here uh so Nat natalie is a fellow skater in san francisco and she's also a voice actress and a former competitive roller skater so i think she was just a perfect fit for that she was perfect for the role when she said do the axle yeah yeah it looks like adam had to move in to to join the cast but i think he was actually the only one that was in the right place on that take <laughs> Melissa sisney and i just love stomping the ice so i got Everyone yeah, I thought, I, yeah, I thought it had uh, a little variety here with a little rhythmic break. We got Jordan Cowan on the camera, and every once in a while Jordan really told the story from inside the scene as he went right in between the skaters every once in a while. And he really, as usual, didn't have a lot of time to get used to the number because we just had such a limited amount of time. We call this the sexy part. Yeah, we saw that coming. <laughs> And here's the other music joke that you might want to talk about. There's Neil Shelton coming in. 
And um, this is the part where I, I wanted him to like just be too darn sexy. And so this is where you, you know, kind of simulated a song that everyone can recognize without, without recognizing it. Uh, here you when, go, chaos. When he falls, it's supposed to be the banana peel that Colin Brubaker was going to be eating and dropping. Um, and that's just one of the things that I'd ah. love to revisit and get all the food into the equation. I leave the set and Joe takes over and starts teaching the Broadway piece one more time. What people might not get to recognize, but maybe you will if you watch it back without our voices, is how you sort of stepped up the Broadway piece to be more filled up each time, Jonathan. Yeah. So you could really hear it in the arena how the first time we hear it, and now this is the second time we hear it when he's rehearsing his cast. And then the, well, like, it'll come back one more time and it was so f flushed out with more instruments. Right. Hey, meet my new star. Yeah. Thought the gunshot was a really great way to break that. So it's really fun to be up close with the camera work, but what you're not seeing is the whole ice being filled with all the skaters um, working hard, you know, doing all sorts of cool steps and working together as a team. Now you see them start to move together a little bit. But when you have only one eye through the camera lens, um, it's kind of yeah. tough to make the cues. should do like a VR version of it. think we've had enough of whatever. This is The, uh, the director was a lot of fun to play because he's obviously very arrogant, even though he doesn't have a clue what's going on. This section just needs one more thing, me. Well, I, I think that was an idea we got from the right, right from the beginning, you know, that arrogant director. I think we had that nailed from the start. And then something out of left field. Well, since we're already fooling around with music genres, you know, might as well go completely nuts, right? I love that part. I think it's brilliant. All the skates falling in sync. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if it was because it was quiet there, but um, the audience agrees with you. They all, like, you could just feel every single person laugh out loud at that moment just because it was so simple. But yeah. to have a rock star with a, you know, a yellow balloon guitar, <laughs> you know, it was, it was like obvious that we were out there having a good time and not trying to take ourselves too seriously. Just, and we got the security guards blocking the rock star from all the fans. All right. So my real challenge on this track was to create rock music that sounded sort of amateur and comical. You know, that's not easy to do. Like you're like some kids in the basement just going crazy on, on his exactly. guitar. I'm not buying what you're selling. Out of here. I'm not buying what you're selling. Next. So I called this the audition scene, which each oh, each movie. genre of music comes back, and they all yeah, get each, two counts of eight. character has their own music genre, so it goes all over the place. I am paying attention. And Joe's playing. Please watch the Broadway piece. And I go. I'm I'm busy. I'm I, I know what I'm doing. You again? Why do you keep coming back to my set? You're too darn sexy. That's Great. Right. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite parts. You're too darn sexy. I strongly suggest the Broadway number. Oh, a five, six, seven, eight. And here's the real jewel. That's the piece oh. I've been losing sleep over. But so this work. is the first piece that Jonathan sent me, and I would I knew that we were gonna be okay when I heard this. I just fell in love with it right away. Well, At least you Jack did the costumes. Good. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Jonathan. It, um, yeah, the, the reason I sent that to you first is because it's so much easier to then take away rather than add. So, you know, once you have this, you can make a whole show from that. I thought the music was so beautiful that it could be a, a group number on its own. So I've been talking to uh, Douglas Webster at IDI and saying, you know, that you can use this part. And, and Jonathan could make it 45 seconds longer, probably. And yeah, like the, if the, the show line. didn't seem appropriate, or if you didn't have the props with you, that you could just do this. Alicia Jackson did the costumes, and what she was able to do, and it's a, a little hard to see 
um, is that she made sure that everybody kind of had a more familiar look for this last piece. Um, so skirts were turned inside out. You can see that the disco girl, Lara there, is kind of different. Okay, now you're ruining my music. <laughs> yeah? No. Oh. And that interaction is one of my favorites. You, you, you. And I say, yeah, and he goes, oh, no. But Joe did a great job. Look, Lara spinning in the background. Big finish coming up. Don't fall. Whoa. I love it. Yes. Yeah, so that was literally the last thing we did was the last part of the, the show, like when you're falling. And I did the music, like, you know, the last, the really last thing we did. Yeah, at the last minute. I mean, then that's it. I like the, I like the how the ending turned out. Um, if I was anything that I would choose to re really redo, it would be to showcase the relationship between um, Joe, the assistant, and the director, where he's got the chair underneath him, and he's he's going to sit, and he just barely gets it there in time. And when you watch it back, you realize that that actually isn't implemented strong enough to to make sure that it's a it's a bona fide joke. And uh, and I'd love to get the food back in there. You know, the the one yeah. character's eating all day, which ironically, uh, as I was told and eventually noticed on my own, Colin Brewbreaker is a really tall, handsome, very thin, very svelte man who eats all day. It's just, uh, you know, it's just so typecast and it would just yeah. actually happen to be him. So there you have it. Misdirected, but not miss music. <laughs> <laughs> Well, quite an adventure, wasn't it? Uh, more like a journey, I would say. It really was. And you know what? It, it, you hope that the audience, uh, in, in one of the takes, takes whatever they want from it, uh, a couple of laughs, a bit of a giggle, but also a break, you know, to allow uh, the beautiful uh, aesthetic of, of what IDI is sort of known for, those, those classic group numbers that, that flow and almost more like ballet than, than ice skating. And um, when you see, you know, a 45 minute long show, um, we, we wanted to create something that would be a, a little bit of a seventh inning stretch for the audience. So that, you know, if you just have, you know, cake all through dinner, after a while, you're not tasting the cake. So it's nice to hopefully um, give uh, Douglas Webster and IDI this tool that they can use to break up shows and to, to give everyone a mental break and to allow the beautiful music and the music, um, it's not beautiful, the beautiful skating to come back in in full force and uh, to be acknowledged and recognized and appreciated. Sure. And it really um, shows how much IDI can, you know, get out there in terms of uh, different styles and different genres and different emotions. And they have a whole range now, um, you know, from uh, very heartfelt pieces to comedic pieces, you know, they have everything now. So it's and like Solstice was like a, a story for um, those, and those it's young almost like a Disney people. story, you know, almost it's just so, uh, yeah, I think it's great. Can't wait to see okay. where this is all going. So once again, thank you to Douglas Webster um, for bringing the two of us together. And thank you for Tina Tian, who has basically just sort of kept my career, uh, you know, cataloged, my gosh, from the very beginning. And, um, and she's a, a real friend. Uh, thank you for Sherilyn, who's going to edit this baby together. And uh, thank you, of course, to all of you for joining us. I highly recommend watching Misdirected one more time without us talking uh, so that you can hear the characters talk and, uh, and have the thoughts of the creative process in the back of your mind that we hope helps you enjoy um, Misdirected even more. And tune into IDI for more amazing shows coming hopefully to you soon in your area. And um, we'll see you out in the ice sometime. Jonathan, we have to get on the ice together someday. Yes, I would love to. <laughs> All right and work together again soon. Anything you want to say to say goodbye? Well, um, thank you for, uh, for having me uh, just share some insights on, on Misdirected. Uh, it was a lot of fun to create um, and especially seeing it all come together with, you know, my music performed to, uh, you know, skating performed to my music with like 13 professional skate uh, or 10 professional skaters. That was uh, it's fantastic. It's something that not a lot of composers get to brag about so early on in their career. So thank you for that, uh, both to you, Kurt, and to IDI, Douglas Webster. Uh, fantastic uh, video uh, also, and then just the costumes were amazing. And yeah, it's just, uh, we nailed it, I think. Yep.
Alicia Jackson did a great job in the costumes. Jordan, thanks for filming. Uh, Lara and Neil uh, Shelton. Um, I'm going to read the name so I don't forget anyone because I forgot Lara one time. And I don't want to do that again. Angela Wang, Alyssa Sisney, Ksenia Potomariova, um, Colin Brubaker, Adam Kaplan, Joe Johnson, who was my assistant. Thank you, Joe. And Karina Manta. I look forward to working with you again. See you at the rink sometime, everybody. Bye. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Peace.